Troubleshooting in Linux. In this video we're going to continue to talk about troubleshooting in your Linux system and the aim of this particular video is to familiarize you with more tools and commands that are central to troubleshooting problems. We're also going to look at some classic or common problems that people come across in Linux and walk you through troubleshooting those from beginning to end. So let's get started. We're going to start this troubleshooting video by talking about useful commands and some of these you might have already seen before but this will give you a chance to brush up on them and also see them in the context of troubleshooting. And we'll examine log files with some of these commands, look at some errors in log files, learn how to track them down, uh, talk about boot problems and how to boot off of an emergency recovery disk, and then also just talk about some common or classic problems in Linux that people always run across and how to recognize these problems and how to solve them from beginning to end. Okay, so uh, let's move out back out to the Linux screen and get started on this. The first command that I want to talk about in this uh, useful commands for troubleshooting is the find command. Now the find command, what it does is it finds a file on your system either by name or modification date or o owner of the file, things like that. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to use the find command to look for some files in our system. Let me switch over to be the super user here so that we can uh, actually find the files because we have to have access permissions to the directories to be able to find files in those directories. Okay, so the most basic form of the find command is you give it a directory to start looking in. So I'm going to just say the slash directory. So I'm looking on my whole system and this says look in the root directory and every other directory below it. So this is going to look in the whole entire system for a file. And the most basic way to use find is to use the name qualifier minus name and then what you do is you give the name of the file that you're looking for. Now if you know the exact name of the file you can type it in. You can also use wildcards like we've seen before and you can use them here and this would say something like uh, find all the files on the system that end in dot local. They can start with anything, right? That's what the star says. But they have to end in dot local. Okay? So if we do this and hit enter here, hopefully it doesn't scroll off the screen on me. And yeah, so there's about 10 answers here and, uh, and you know these are all the files on the system that end in dot local. Now you could narrow down your search. You could say, okay, I just want the stuff in the Etsy directory and you could do it that way and then that'll find stuff in, Etsy, in the Etsy directory and below it. Okay? So that's how you can use find in sort of the most basic way. Now let's look how to use it with like modification times and, and user ID, stuff like that. Let's look at the man page for find to see how we use these more advanced options. I'm going to page down here with the space bar to get down to the test section. Here we go. So uh, there's some discussion here about numeric arguments. Let's hold off on that for a second. Instead, let's look at a class of, of, of uh, options that we can use with find here. So we have my, a min, we have a newer, and a time. Well, a min and a time both take a numeric, numeric argument. You just give a number with them. So the a here stands for access. So if I say find minus a min 5, that's going to find the files that were accessed 5 minutes ago. All right? But when I specify that 5, just plain, I just put minus a min 5, it's going to find files that were accessed exactly n minutes ago. See, if I specify the number plain, it's, looking, it's using it as an exact number. Right? But I can, if I want to find files that were accessed you know, more recently than 5 minutes ago, then I can use a minus sign in front of that 5. So if I said minus a min minus 5, that would find files that were accessed less than 5 minutes ago. And if I put a plus sign in front of that 5, that would find files that were accessed greater than 5 minutes ago. So personally, I use the plus and the minus option. You know, that's all I ever use. I never really use this exact option. I don't, you know, I, how would I know when the file was last accessed exactly? All right, but it is a way to narrow things down more. If you if you try it once with five minutes, and you try it again with six, and try it again with seven, to see what was ex accessed exactly seven minutes ago, maybe that would be useful for you in certain circumstances. I definitely use these two way more often. So that's for file access, the a min and the a time. If we page down again with the space bar, uh, another one that I use a lot is the m min and m time, and this has to do with a file being modified. All right, and again, the same thing holds. The n option there, we can use a plus or a minus in front of it to uh, represent greater than or less than that number that we specify. All right, so let's quit out of here and uh, actually do a find command. I'm going to say I'm in the home peri directory here, so let me just do a find dot, which says start in the current working directory, home peri, and look in all the directories below that. And I'm going to say minus m min, and I'm going to say minus 10. See what was accessed in the last or modified in the last 10 minutes. So I do that and a bunch of stuff comes up here. Now I swear to you that I have not modified any of these files, but the reason that they're all coming up as modified is some program is modifying them. All right? And you can notice they're all in the .gnome directory, which is, you know, gnome is my desktop environment, and the .gnome directory keeps a bunch of files for gnome. 
okay so when gnome needs to uh you know write something to keep track of what's going on on, the, on that for in my desktop environment it can write to some of these files here if i open some window or something some file in here gets written to keep track of that window okay so so all these files even though i have not personally modified them they all come up in the find command because they've been modified by some program so keep this in mind if you do this kind of a search like in the on the slash directory you're gonna find all sorts of modified files because all the log files the spool files for the printing and the mail and stuff like that all those files are, are gonna be modified by some program and you're gonna get pages and pages of data that come up when uh, you do this kind of a search on you know the slash directory or the slash var directory or something like that Okay, so just keep that in mind. That you, for those kind of searches, you want to pipe it through more or something so that you can see all the data so it doesn't scroll off the screen. Let me show you a couple more commands that are useful for troubleshooting. And these commands are really useful for doing things like going through log files. Okay, so let's go up to the var log directory and look at some log files there. And, uh, and, and let me show you the first command, grep. And what grep does is it looks for a string of characters or like a word in a, in a files that you specify. So let me show you how to use it. So if I say grep network in boot.log, right, and I hit enter here, then it'll print out every line in boot.log that has the word network on it. All right. Now the word, it, it could be networking or networked or I network or whatever, and it would still print out. In this case, it's actually just the word network appears by itself on three different lines. And you can see that my network was brought up successfully the last time my system booted. All right. So uh, the, the point of this is that, you know, if, if your network didn't come up or if your network isn't working right now, you could come up to the, to the log directory here and grep for network in the boot log and see if it was brought up successfully. And if it was, then you can narrow down the time frame when the network went down. OK, and maybe that'll give you some clues as to why it's not working right now. All right. So, so, you know, and this just saves you from having to go through the boot.log file, you know, line by line and reading every single line in the file. Now you can also use grep on like the whole directory. I could say grep network on star, okay? And what this would do uh, is it would, it would look for network in every single file in this directory, all right? So let me hit enter here. Actually, let me pipe it through more first because there's going to be a whole bunch of them, I'm sure. And uh, I'll pipe it through more and hit enter here. And you can see over here on the left is uh, the name of the file that it found the word network in. And then after the colon there is the actual output from that file, that actual line of output. And if I page down here, um, you can see it's in boot log one, boot log two, and so on. It's in messages, messages one, two, three. And it's also in this RPM packages. And if you look in there, it's like KDE network dash two, whatever. Okay, and, and it's still matched because the word network is mixed in there somewhere. It's, it's still in that order, N-E-T-W-O-R-K, even though it's mixed in with all this other stuff. All right, so, so there's how to use grep in like its most simplistic form. Uh, if you find yourself using grep all the time and, and, and you know, you want to make it, you want to even be more powerful with it, well, really that, that word network is really just an instance of this pattern or this regular expression. That's what the RE stands for in grep, regular expression. And this is like some computer science theory thing that, that you know, you can build up these regular expressions to describe all sorts of patterns. I could make it so, um, you know, I can look for network in the file, but only if it's like the beginning of a line or only if it's at the end of a line or only if it has a space on each side of it or something like that. And I can specify very complicated, very precise patterns so that I could get, you know, matches exactly what I want. I don't just get all these random matches that I have to sort through. I can match exactly, exactly what I want with this. And if you find yourself using grep all the time, take, you know, uh, take, take a couple days and learn about all these uh, regular expressions and patterns that you can specify. And it'll just make grep that much more powerful and that much more useful to you. Now, another command that uh, I want to show you is the tail command. And this is a really easy command. Basically, all tail does is prints out the end of files. So if I say something like, uh, let me clear the screen first before I do this. If I say something like tail messages, okay, you'll see the last 10 lines of the messages file. And the reason that the tail command exists is just because when you're looking at log files, right, it's like the, the stuff that's at the end of the log file is the most recent stuff, and that's probably what you want to be looking at. You don't want to be looking at stuff that's happened way in the past. You want to look at the most recent stuff. And you can make uh, tail uh, print out more than the last 10 lines. If you want the last 20 lines, you can say tail uh, minus n20. And then you can get uh, 20 lines of output, the last 20 lines of some particular file. All right? And that's just a useful way uh, of you know, uh, finding out what's going on recently in your log files.
Let me show you one more thing that you can do with the tail command and that's use the minus F option. The tail minus F option, minus F just stands for follow. So this what it does is it follows the progress of some log in real time. So if I do this to var log messages, you'll see a whole bunch of messages come out, 10 just like before. Except now notice I don't have a command prompt here. And that's because if something new uh, got written to that log, it would get written to my screen right here as soon as it got written to the log. Okay, let me show you how this works firsthand. I'm going to open up a new terminal here and just slide it off to the side. And what I'm going to do in this new terminal is just become the super user. Okay, that's, that's uh, a way that you get a log entry in there. So I'll do this and hit enter, but keep your eye back here on the screen because when I hit enter, there's going to be a new entry in that log file. So I'll do that and, uh, oh, and I actually type the incorrect password, but still you see authentication failure, log name Perry, uh, who, you know, was trying to gain access to a super user. Okay, right there. Okay, so he was trying to become the super, he was trying to switch user to be root, but there was an authentication failure. That showed up as soon as it happened in real time. As soon as I hit enter here, boom, it got written to var log message and messages and it got displayed to the screen. So this is a nice way, the tail minus F option is a nice way to just keep track of some log. You don't have to keep saying tail messages, tail messages, tail messages. You just do this once and you can watch when new errors come in. If you're trying to track something down that's happening right now, you know, this is the way to do it. Okay, let me clear out of here and uh, quit being the root user. And now we're back in the Perry account. And what I've gotten here now that I want to show you is a uh, is a, this file called Messages. That's just a piece of somebody's var log messages uh, log that I pulled off the internet. And the reason we're looking at this person's uh, messages file instead of mine is because mine's not that interesting. You know, like all my hardware is working, knock on wood. And uh, and, and, you know, all that's working right now, I don't really have any really interesting error messages in my log files, and so I just pulled somebody else's off the internet to look at. Okay, I guess I, I just don't feel like sticking a screwdriver in my disk drive just to show you some interesting error messages. So, so what we got here is we got an error message, you see over here by the time 1206.59, 1207.59, 1208.08, and so on. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, this is the error log. It's happening very frequently. And what is it? You know, what, what, can we tell what it is? Well, it's, it's pretty hard to tell, right? For an inexperienced user, you might have a hard time just figuring out what the heck is going on here. Well, one thing you can discern is like an ATA device is like an IDE device. So this is some kind of a disk drive, an IDE disk drive. And some write command is having a timeout. It's not, it's not succeeding. So they're resetting the devices. You know, what's happening? Well, what's happening here is that some disk drive is failing or some connector for the disk drive is failing. And you know, if I saw this error message, the first thing I would do is mess with the cables and see if I can get the error to stop. So maybe I would, uh, you know, tail the messages file, do it the tail minus F on var log messages and, and see if I can like hold the cables in if I think something's loose. Maybe I can hold it in and say I hold it in for like three minutes and no more, no errors come up in the three minutes that I'm holding it. Well, then that would tell me that there's like some kind of a bad connector or a bad cable involved and I would just work to replace that or get a new plug for it or whatever. Okay, but if I hold it in or I mess with the cables and the errors keep coming up at like, you know, once a minute or whatever they're coming up at now, you know, then I know that it's really the disk drive that's failing and I would be on the phone ordering a new disk drive and, and backing up all my important data that hasn't been backed up yet. Okay, so, th so this is some, some error message. It's kind of a classic one. The, the problem here is that an inexperienced user wouldn't necessarily know this and that's where you should use, you know, the user groups, post to the news groups and say, hey, here's a little piece of my uh, messages uh, log file. I don't know what's going on. Can somebody tell me? And somebody out there will tell you what's going on. Just provide them with enough information. Make sure you tell them what version of Linux you're running, like which, whether it's Red Hat or Mandrake or, and also what version you're running and, and, you know, what your messages file is and try and give them some background that you think might be relevant and, and you know, people will be out there to help you out. Now let's talk about what you need to do if your system doesn't boot up. Okay, first let, let's talk about how to like understand what's wrong with your system and then we'll talk about how to recover from that. All right, so the first thing that I want to do is just look, show you, uh, you know, the Lilo error codes. And you can find these all over the place. I, I just, you know, I'll just search in Google. I found them a little while ago. Um, I, I search for Lilo error codes or something like that. Okay, now if we search for Lilo error codes, here's, here's the first page, Lilo boot error codes. Um, and, and basically uh, w what Lilo boot error codes are is it's like some piece of uh, the Lilo loader. Okay, so when Lilo loads itself, it displays the word Lilo and each, printed, each letter is printed after some action has taken place. Okay, so if the whole word fails to, fails, uh, fails to print, then something is wrong in the process. 
All right, so here's the, a summary of this. Uh, you know, if nothing gets outputted, that means no part of Lilo has been loaded. If just the L has been output, that means the first stage has been loaded, but, the, but, um, but it can't load the second stage of the bootloader. Okay. Now sometimes there's a two-digit error code here to, to indicate the type of problems um, and usually this indicates a media, media failure which just means like your disk isn't working, something's wrong with your disk or a geometry mismatch and what that means is like you, uh, you know the, the disk just, just is laid out differently than the system is expecting maybe uh, the disk was on some different system and you like took it out of one system and you tried to use it on a different system and that can cause problems, these geometry mismatch problems. Uh, you can also see here LI means the first stage was able to load the second stage but it failed to execute it. Um, again, geometry mismatch or moving the boot slash boot dot B uh, file okay, without running the map installer. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, then there's LIL, LIL question mark, LIL minus, and then finally LILO which says everything's been loaded successfully. So depending on what you're doing here, like all these LI, LIL, LIL question mark, all of these, uh, sorry, all of these uh, files or all these descriptions here, basically what they have to do with is that, uh, you know, you change something or you moved some file. Okay, and Lilo does not automatically uh, recover data from changed configuration files. It doesn't look at those configuration files when it starts up. M remember, we were talking before that you know when you st restart a program, it reads its configuration files. Lilo doesn't do that. To get Lilo to take those changes, to you know to read those changes, you have to run the Lilo command, L-I-L-O. You run that command, and then you can uh, make those changes permanent. All right. So Lilo does not read Lilo.conf every time it starts up, and instead you've got to run it explicitly before you shut down your system. Okay, and that's that's a big issue with Lilo. But but you know the the bad part of that is right. It's a tough error to recover from. Um, it's not that tough, but you you have to be prepared for it uh, to to you know to boot your system without using Lilo. So let's get to that now. So let me explain to you how to boot without Lilo. If, if Lilo is the only problem, like you've moved some files around and you changed some configurations and Lilo is not working anymore, then what you can do is you can boot with an alternative program like LoadLin. Now LoadLin runs under DOS but it can also boot Linux. So what you need to run LoadLin or to get it to boot your Linux image is you need a DOS boot floppy, you need a copy of LoadLin.exe and you need a copy of your Linux kernel. Typically that's called VM Linus and it's in your slash boot directory. So you get all this on a floppy okay and then what you, what you can do is you boot DOS and then you run LoadLin, you give the name of your kernel VM Linus and then you give the root directory on your hard disk okay the, the device that holds the root directory. So here I've said root equals dev SDA1, maybe it's HDA3 on your machine, whatever it is, whatever holds the root uh, partition there, you give that device. And now what's going to happen is this kernel image is going to be running and this root file system is what it's going to use to, uh, you know, for all of its configuration settings and so on. Once you have access to this now, what you can do is you can go in and make the changes that you, to, to Lilo that you need to. You make the changes to Lilo.com or you move the files around to where, where they should be or whatever you need to do. And then uh, when you shut down and reboot, uh, you know, Lilo should, should kick in and work correctly if, if you did everything right here. Okay, so this is your way to get in, get a copy of Linux running, and, and get access to your system again. Now, like I said, this works great if Lilo is the issue. But, you know, if your disk is corrupted or something like that, you need to take, you know, more extreme measures. You need to have an emergency boot disk around. And you should always have one of these around anyway. Uh, a lot of times these come with your distribution. Uh, depending on the distribution of Linux that you got, you might have an emergency boot disk as part of it. You can certainly download emergency boot disks off the web. If you go to www.linux.org slash dist for distribution, uh, you, you can find all sorts of distributions in there. If you search for minimalist, they have this little search criteria there. If you search for minimalist distributions, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of distributions that like fit on a floppy or two. and, and basically Basically, you can get those, uh, you know, to, to boot up Linux and supply all the necessary stuff that you need to boot Linux, and then also, uh, 
you know, recover your, you know, re, re, recover your disk. You know, if your disk is corrupted, you can get some tools working on that to make it so that you, you can actually boot your system off the hard disk again. Noteworthy in this whole bunch of minimalist distributions is the one that's uh, Tom's root boot disk. It's just Tom's RTBT. Um, so this is Tom's root boot disk, has all sorts of stuff on it. Basically, the tools that you want on an emergency disk are things like drivers, a text editor like VI because it's really small, F disk so that you can uh, look at disk problems and, and uh, you know, repair things, stuff like that. Okay, so these kinds of tools, all sorts of other stuff too you might want on there. Um, maybe you want something like network software if you're going to restore your system from uh, a networked backup. If it's on some other machine, then maybe you need some network software on there. And you know, you can build your own emergency disk if you have some customized thing. And there's there's websites out there on how to do that on Linux.org. There's uh, discussions on how to build your own emergency disk if you have specific needs. But typically, uh, one of the one of the ones that are already out there, like Tom's root boot disk, will do the job for you. And and basically, what you're doing here is Tom's root boot disk has uh, you know the root partition on it, and it's also bootable. So you put that disk in, you turn your computer on, it'll boot off that. It's got the root partition. It's got some basic tools so that you can uh, recover your Linux system. A more common day-to-day -day task for system administrators is dealing with uh, user problems and troubleshooting those kinds of problems. Now, now user problems are a little tricky because somebody might come to you and say well this is wrong and you've got to evaluate whether that's that's really wrong for them or it's just you know their misunderstanding of how things work. And remember, one of the, the SU command, remember this stands for switch user. Even though we use it all the time to become the super user or the root user, SU really stands for switch user. And when we were back there adding user accounts, you know, 10 videos ago or something, uh, we used the SU command to switch into different users. So here, let me switch over to be the user Alice. So in this case, uh, if I'm the root user, I can use, say, SU Alice, and now I'll become Alice. And you can see I'm Alice at Nugget1 now. And if I CD to go to my home directory, uh, you can see I'm in home Alice. Okay, so I'm going to be working now with all the permissions of Alice. And uh, if Alice had some problem accessing some file that, th that she thought she should be able to access, you can switch over and try to access that file. And if you could access it and she couldn't, then you could say, oh, well, there's some, you know, you don't know how to do it. Here's how you do it and teach her how to do it. Or, you know, if, if you can't access it either, then it's some valid complaint that she's got and you can investigate that. But at least you've narrowed down whether it's actually something that's set up with wrong permissions or it's just her lack of understanding on how things work. All right, and, and so that's a powerful way to switch over to be a different user if it's some problem they have like with permissions or something. If it's some problem they have with, say, uh, you know, like they can't log in. Well, then, you know, you've got to give Alice the chance to log in. Give her the chance to log in on your computer if you've got the chance to do that. And, and if she can log in on yours but she can't log in on her, on her computer on her desk, then you've narrowed things down already, right? You can say, okay, well, it's something on that computer. Uh, maybe, you know, some key on the keyboard is sticking. Maybe uh, the caps lock key is on. And so, you know, Linux passwords are case sensitive, right? And if the caps lock key got stuck on, then uh, she's not going to be able to type her password in that way because uh, the password passwords are case sensitive. Okay, so those kinds of issues, you just narrow things down, you investigate and you say, okay, what is the cause of this? What is not the cause of this? And once you can narrow some things out or rule some things out, then you've narrowed down the problem and you can, you can find out the uh, cause of it much easier. Another common problem that people have in Linux is with printing. And it's not that printing's that hard, it's just that it's different from other operating systems. Like on the Macintosh or on the Windows machines, you go under the file menu in some application and down here somewhere there's a print option and you click on that and it prints the file that you're working on. Well, Linux doesn't work like that, right? Linux has the LPR command, and, and some, uh, some applications actually do have that print button, but even some of those applications that have a print button, when you click on it, a little dialog box comes up and says, what's the command you want me to use to print, right? And then you have to type in the print command anyway, like LPR, maybe you have to give the minus P option and name the printer as well. Okay, so, uh, so here's how I would name the HP1 printer for the LPR option. And I might have to do that in some dialog box even if there is a print button on, on, in that application. All right, so, so typically you have to use the LPR command. And LPR definitely prints text, it prints PostScript just fine. It, what, what it doesn't necessarily print is things like PDF files, for instance. And there, in that case, you have to do a conversion to PostScript before you can print them. Okay, so let me show you how to do this. If we go down into the hold directory here and do a listing, I've got this file called linuxobjectives.pdf. It's just CompTIA's objectives for the Linux Plus exam. 
All right, and what I'm going to do is I want to print this out to the screen or print this out to the printer, but there is no uh, PDF filter I've, in in my chain between uh, in the print queue chain there. Okay, so there is no PDF filter, so I've got to convert this to PostScript first, and the way that I can do that is with this uh, utility called PDF to PS. So this will convert. Uh, PDF files to PostScript files. And what I do here is I give the one file I, and then I convert it to PostScript. So I say Linux, Linux objectives.pdf to Linux objectives.ps. I do that, it takes a couple seconds. I do a listing and there's my Linux objectives.ps file. And now I can print that out to the um, printer just as the PS file and it's going to print out much nicer than the PDF file. Okay, so, uh, so, so you can make up little scripts to do this if you want, to do these conversions, uh, w whatever works for you. Basically, the idea is you have to get it into PostScript format, or you've got to put some kind of special filter in the, in the path there to the printer that, that takes care of PDF files and converts them to PostScript. Now what I want to do is take you through a troubleshooting example just from beginning to end. Okay, so here's an example that, that comes up sometimes. You're, uh, the, uh, you're the system administrator and you've mounted a CD-ROM for some people to use and now you've got another CD-ROM that you want to mount for, for you or for somebody else to use. And so you go to unmount the, uh, the old one and so you remember you can unmount it with the U-mount command that we've learned before. And uh, you can unmount it by either specifying the device, like slash dev slash CD-ROM, or you can unmount it by specifying the mount point. So here I'm going to say slash mount slash CD-ROM, that's the mount point of my device, and this is how I can unmount it. So I do that, and it says the device is busy. Okay, well why is the device busy? Well, maybe the device is busy because somebody's using a file there. Okay, so you could shoot an email out to everybody and say, hey, is anybody using this? And everybody, and people write back, no, I haven't used that. You know, it's been an hour since I've used that. And so now you have to find out, well, wait, somebody's using it, right? Something's going on. And so you don't want to have to go around to every single person's machine and look and see if they're using some file there. So instead, what you can do is you can use the LSOF command. Okay, the LSOF command lists open files. That's what it stands for, list open files. And, and this will list open files in the whole system. So if I just do LSOF and I pipe it through more, you're going to see just how many open files there are on the system. Okay, let me hit spacebar to page down here. And I'm just going to hit, I mean, there's hundreds of these, right? You don't want to have to go through every single one of these files and read each line, line by line, and see if one of them has to do with the CD-ROM, right? So let's use, uh, instead of doing that, let's use LSOF, and instead of piping it through more, let's pipe it through a grep statement that, we, that we've now uh, brushed up on. And this grep statement can look through that whole output list for some particular word, like CD-ROM, okay? So I'm going to say LSOF, pipe that through a grep for CD-ROM. Now every line of the output of LSOF that had the word CD-ROM in it is going to display on the screen. So we do that, and here's, here's the answer to our question, okay? It says the bash shell is using it, the process ID is 12052, the owner is Perry, and the current working directory there is mount CD-ROM. Okay, so, so, this, uh, so this is telling us exactly what it is. It tells us that Perry's the culprit, there's the process ID, and he's in the mount CD-ROM directory. Actually, you know, all that, all that Perry's doing here uh, is that he's just sitting in that directory. He's not, he doesn't have any open files, just the, he's just CD'd into mount CD-ROM, did his work, and then just left a shell window there, you know, minimize the window or put it in the background or something, and, and he's not really even doing anything. The point here is that even if you're CD'd into that directory, even if you're in just in the mount CD-ROM directory doing nothing, really what's happening is the bash shell has the mount CD-ROM directory open, and so the operating system will not let you unmount that device. Okay, so you have two options here. One, you could go to Perry and say, hey, you know, get out of that directory, I need to unmount it. Or you could just go ahead and kill this process ID, 12052. Uh, if you were in a real rush or it was some emergency or something, you could just do a kill minus nine on t 12052 and get rid of this thing. I'll just do it that way, just for the heck of it. Um, like so we'll do it like this. And now we do that same LSOF again. We don't get anything. And now when I go to unmount, uh, my CD-ROM, which I'll unmount this time by the device name, I'll do it that way, and now it's unmounted. Okay, so there was our little example um, using LSOF in combination with grep, we were able to see what open files were on the system, and that allowed us to uh, figure out what open files there were, get rid of those open files, and then we could unmount our CD.
Well, it's time to wrap up another nugget. This was our second troubleshooting nugget. Uh, we'll do one more on networking and, and some other miscellaneous issues. In this one, we talked about some useful commands for troubleshooting, like find and grep. We talked about the tail command. And we talked about these in the context of examining log files. Then we moved on and talked about boot problems, uh, you know, how to boot without Lilo, like using LoadLin. We also talked about emergency recover disks a little bit. And you should definitely have one of these emergency recover disks uh, ready because you never know when something's going to go wrong in your system. And then just some common problems, user issues, logging in, permission problems, mount, unmount problems, that kind of stuff. And we just tried to give you a little example of, of these and just to give you a feel for what kind of problems you're going to run across as a system administrator. Well, I hope you found this nugget informative and thanks again for viewing.